now I wanna take a look at four ways to overcome lust. Now let me just preface this by saying that often what we're looking for is an out of the box, crazy uh, idea that you've never thought of that will be quick and simple. That's why you see so many videos like this crazy trick will help you regrow hair or this quick crazy idea will help you lose belly fat. We all want something we've never heard before that's simple and requires nothing of us. You know, GK Chesterton once said that Christianity hasn't been tried and found wanting. It's been found hard or difficult and left untried. So these four things that Thomas Aquinas suggests are four things you've already heard but it doesn't mean they don't work. <laughs> what it means is that we just have to do a better job of putting them into practice. Sound good? As I sip from my water. Here's the first thing that Aquinas says. Now, keep in mind, Aquinas lives in the 13th century, and so we're gonna have to adapt these for the internet age, but let's, 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 let's look through them. Actually, I wonder if I can show you what they look like. Ooh. Let's see, there we go. That's pretty good, isn't it? That look good? Let's go through this. First way we can overcome lust is by fleeing external occasions, such as, for instance, bad company. And in fact, whatever may be an occasion for sin. What's wonderful about Thomas Aquinas is almost every time he makes a point, he backs it up with scripture. He says, do not gaze, and he's quoting here, obviously, Sirach, do not, I think it's Sirach, do not gaze upon a maiden, lest her beauty be a stumbling block for you. Do not look around you in the ways of the city, nor wander up and down in its streets. Turn away your face from a woman dressed up, meaning a prostitute. Do not gaze upon another's beauty, for many have perished by the beauty of a woman, whereby lust is enkindled as a fire. All right. We could obviously apply this if you're a young woman today and you look at pornography and or if you're looking at homosexual pornography like man woman okay we're not just we're not saying that only men struggle with pornography so um put that to one side okay this is really good so we need to flee the near occasions of sin it's not enough to say i will not sin we have to flee those near occasions of sin so if I watch Netflix and I know there's some sexual scenes in it, I'm putting myself in the near occasion of sin. Now, depending on your tolerance for it, you know, like maybe my wife can watch a movie with me that has a brief sexual something or other and it not affect her, but it would affect me. So there needs to be some self-knowledge here, right? So I need to distance myself from that Netflix show or whatever that show is. I need to distance myself from bad company. If I'm surrounding myself with people who are encouraging me to do bad things or are using foul language or are speaking in sexual ways or glorifying fornication or stripping or porn, I need to flee from that like I would from a snake. We have to have the courage to make really good changes in our life. Like right now, what are the changes you're gonna make in your life right now? It's gonna be, it's gonna be tough, like for example, uh, I have a phone and I have blocked the app store. I have the Covenant Eyes app, but nothing else can access the internet. That's, that's kind of a cool thing that you could do. If you find that you can't even be trusted with a smartphone, then think about bad company. See how he says bad company? As your phone, like your phone is your constant companion. Is it bad company? Get rid of it. Break it with a hammer. Drive over it. Like strong decisions need to be made if we're serious about overcoming pornography. And then he quotes Proverbs 627, can a man hide fire in his bosom and his garments not burn? <laughs> Taking it, that's a rhetorical question from Proverbs because uh, no, the answer is that is not possible. And thus Lot was commanded to flee, neither stay you in all the country about. So here's a line for you. Uh, don't be such a coward as to remain. Flee. All right. It's not an act of cowardice to remove yourself from a lion that's trying to eat you. It's prudent and sensible. And if you didn't, you would be an idiot. 
All right, so fleeing from external occasions. Let me know below what are some ways that you have found helpful in fleeing from um, external occasions of sin. Now, you'll notice this next way is really helpful because whereas in the first way he's talking about external occasions, here he's talking about internal occasions, right? Namely our thoughts. He says the second way is by not giving an opening to thoughts which of themselves are the occasion of lustful desires. And this must be done by mortif mortification of the flesh. I chastise my body, I bring it into subjection. So one, a great way to remain stuck in porn is to dissociate and to numb out. Have you ever been in a death scroll on Facebook? Or YouTube, have you ever heard of a death scroll? It's where you're just kind of scrolling, 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 scrolling. Your brain is essentially turning off. You're not in tune with the movements of your heart or your interior life or your thoughts, and it makes you much more susceptible to uh, looking at pornography. By the way, let's just go back up a step here to the first. I like what he said here, he says, uh, do not look around you in the ways of the city, nor wander up and down the streets. That language really refers to a sort of effeminacy, I think, in men in particular. And by the way, when Aquinas uses the term effeminacy, he, he means a softness that we justify, that we give into, and in so doing, abandon our responsibilities and our duties. So when I say effeminacy, I'm not talking about you know, whatever, stereotypical masculine traits or like uh, shallow masculine traits or anything like that. I I'm talking about a sort of softness, right? And this seems to indicate that, like looking around, like not having a firm purpose, right? Wandering up and down the streets. And we can apply that to technology. Don't be looking around, don't be clicking around. Don't be wandering up and down the streets of Instagram, as it were. All right, but back to this, the second way, not giving an opening to thoughts. One thing I found really helpful, and we're gonna address this later on in the live stream, is to recognize when we're being triggered. Like when a thought enters our mind, to be aware of what that thought is leading to and to combat it with another thought, you know? So if a thought comes to me like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just gonna look at pornography one more time, it won't hurt. You know, I could say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke this lie. This has never made me happy before. It won't make me happy now. It'll just further entrench me and enslave me in a sin I don't want to be enslaved in. I rebuke it. So being aware of our thoughts and not giving an opening to them. Like you could think of the devil as like a really smart war strategist who prowls about, there you go, there's an allusion of 1 Peter 5, 8, who prowls about our castle, as it were, looking for an entry point. He's not going to storm the part that he knows is strongest and where he's likely to be repelled. He's going to look for those gaps and weak spots. So to always be aware and not to give the devil an opening. I just was reminded of Snow White. Not the disney version, but the fantastic Brother Grimm's version, right? Where the witch comes to her disguised as something else, disguised as somebody who wishes to do her good. And because Snow White is not on guard, she's taken out. Likewise, we have to be on guard against these thoughts, even when these thoughts dress themselves up, as it were, because we know that what they're offering us is a poison apple, yeah? All right, here's the third way. He says that we can overcome lust, perseverance in prayer perseverance in prayer. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. And also, he said, we read in wisdom, I knew that I could not otherwise be continent except God gave it. And again, from Matthew, this kind of, this kind of sin, this kind is not cast out, say, by prayer and fasting. All this is not unlike to a fight between two persons one of whom you desire to win, the other to lose. You must sustain the one and withdraw all support from the other. So also between the spirit and the flesh, there is a continual combat. Now, if you wish the spirit to win, 
You must assist it by prayer, and likewise you must resist the flesh by such means as fasting. For by fasting the flesh is weakened. All right, so this kind of reminds me of that meme online right now, like within you are two wolves, you know? All right, we won't get into all the humorous aspects and developments of that meme. But that point is you have two wolves within you. One is bad, one is good. And the question is, well, which one wins? The one that you feed, all right? And so I like this a lot. So before the wolf analogy, maybe, uh, we have Thomas Aquinas saying, it's like there's two people fighting, right? And haven't you felt that? You know, like there is a part of you that wants to live a noble life that wants to be about good things, that doesn't want to be dragged into the murk and underbelly of the world. But then there's a part of you that is in pain and just wants to satisfy yourself immediately. I know what that's like. I mean, anybody who's ever tried to stick to a diet uh, or a lifestyle, if you don't like the word diet, has, has experienced this. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, like, <laughs> what's that shirt that says, I want a six pack, but I also want tacos. <laughs> Whatever you want more, you know, is, is gonna win. And so sustaining that part of you that you want to win, right? Not lying, not, not feeding that part of you that's gonna make you unhappy. So is it gonna be difficult to abstain from this new Netflix or Amazon show that everybody's been telling you to watch? Yeah, it will. But in the long run, you'll be happy, happier, because that Netflix show may feed that part of you that's going to make you unhappy. So abstaining from external occasions of sin, exter abstaining from internal occasions of sin, but then also doing something productive, right? Praying and fasting. Now, here's how I like to think of fasting, right? If I can't say no to that next cup of coffee or that next alcoholic drink or that next Oreo cookie, if I cannot say no to those things, how will I say no to not looking at pornography? Because here's the thing, all things being equal, um, pornography is actually much more pleasurable. Masturbation, sexual delight is more pleasurable. Again, you know, unless you're starving to death, but then that Oreo cookie, right? than that alcoholic drink, than that next cup of coffee. So if we can begin to deny ourselves these small things that will strengthen our will to then deny these greater things that are more difficult to overcome. Now, there's different thoughts on this, but I'm of the opinion that if you're someone who would say, look, I'm addicted to porn, or you might say, not use the word addicted, but you, know, you might just say, I'm hooked on porn. I think it'd be helpful to give up those things that often precede you looking at pornography, right? So as good as it is to, to fast from food, to fast from alcohol, to fast from warm showers, right? All of that has its place and can be fantastic. But maybe fast from YouTube. So for example, I, I said earlier, I use Covenant Eyes. So I've used Covenant Eyes to block Twitter because you there's like a blacklist you can Put in right i don't want to be on twitter i don't want to look at it not for sexual reasons just because i think it's a cesspool of awful humanness so maybe you disagree but if you do you're wrong so um i don't i can't access twitter i can't so like here let me let me show you let me show you right now if i go here and click twitter it doesn't work it doesn't work and i like that you know so Choosing to do things like that, I think that's that's a really good idea. All right, let's go to the fourth way. Keeping yourself busy with wholesome occupations, right? So we're talking about praying, we're talking about fasting. These things are very important. Let's say one more thing about prayer. Prayer is not the coin I use to put into the vending machine, AKA God, to get the thing I want. We want to refrain from a transactional relationship with being itself, from the omnipotent, omnibenevolent, omnipresent God who sent his son to die for you and wants a relationship with you. But sometimes we do treat God like that. We're like, well, I said my prayers, therefore I shouldn't, why am I being tempted? This doesn't make any sense. No, I think what we want is intimacy with the father who loves us. Like God isn't scandalized by your sins. He's not shocked by them. It's not like it 
took him unawares. Like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. The day that God saved you, brought you into a saving relationship with himself, he, it's, he's aware of your future, just like he's aware of your past. You and I are only vaguely aware of our past. We are completely unaware, for the most part, I suppose, of our future. But God is, God sees your future like he sees your past. He's not, sh so when he saved you, he knew that you would fall today or yesterday or tomorrow or five weeks from now. He loves you deeply. And so I think this confidence in the love of the Father is what we want to cultivate in prayer. This intimacy with the one who loves us. We want him to be our refuge, right? As the Psalms repeatedly say, not porn. We want God to be our refuge. So when I'm in pain, when I'm frustrated, when I'm angry, when life is chaotic, I want him to be my refuge, my fortress, not porn. All right, fourth way is to keep oneself busy with wholesome occupations. From Sirach, idleness hath taught much evil. Again, this was the iniquity of Sodom, your sister, pride, fullness of bread and abundance, and the idleness of her. Saint Jerome says, be always busy in doing something good so that the devil may find you ever occupied. What's funny to me is sometimes we hear um, these like cliches and we forget that, that some of them originate either in scripture or the church fathers and so should be treated seriously, right? Be always busy in doing something good so that the devil may find you ever occupied. Now, says Aquinas, studying the scriptures is the best of all occupations. There you go. There's Thomas Aquinas. Studying scripture is the best of all occupations. As St. Jerome tells us, love to study the scriptures and you will not find, and you will not love the vices of the flesh. Now you say that and it sounds easy, right? You think it can't be that easy. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it's just that you and I don't love the scriptures as we ought to. And by love, I don't mean some feeling, some warm and fuzzy feeling about the scriptures that you need to cultivate or else you're not properly loving them. How about just preferring them? What if I preferred scripture to the Daily Wire? What if I, what if I read more scripture than text messages daily? What if I really began to seriously cultivate a daily habit of meditating on the Holy Scriptures? And again, I think sometimes we have this exaggerated lofty view of prayer or the scriptures, you know, like we have to feel a certain way for it to be working. It's like, no, no, no. We just have to put ourselves before it. There's this great group called Exodus 90, uh, who I promote on my other podcast, Pints with Aquinas. And Exodus 90 has like a 21 day challenge and a 90 day challenge. And it's pretty cool because you join forces with a few other brothers and for 90 days fast from things you don't want to fast from like warm showers and take up things that maybe you're not used to taking up like hour an hour of prayer a day or something like that in fact as i'm talking i think i'm gonna bloody do it i think i'm gonna do exodus 21. exodus 90 was way too long for me but exodus 21 check it out exodus 90.com they're not telling me to promote this i just really believe in the work that they're doing but that's a way to kind of be accountable to daily scripture reading to keeping yourself busy in wholesome occupations because it's so much easier. It's so much bloody easier to watch Jordan Peterson or something or Joe Rogan or cat videos or who cares anyway on YouTube than to be really intentional with our life, you know? And one of the ways we can be intentional is by bringing other people along with us, finding someone, even if they don't live in the same city as us, bring them, bringing them along for the ride with us, as it were. Check it out, please. Please check it out. All right, so there are some ways that uh, there's four ways, which I think are like really, really good. I'd love you to tell me below in the comments section what you think about that and what are some helpful ways that you've found to, to overcome last. All right. What are